you know, first 20 years of the 19th century. But they had them. Mm. You know, you go out there on Long Island, where they grow all their grapes and stuff, you know, for the wine that you all don't drink. I'm not supposed to. Uh, slaves grew those grapes. You know, you go to the store and say apples, oranges, tangerines. Slaves grew those apples and oranges and tangerines. You know, people want to forget about that. You know, the first state to, in fact, bring slavery onto the legal books was, in fact, Massachusetts. You know, you don't hear a lot about that either. You know. You know. So we have Sojourner Truth that stands here in the north and says, wait a minute, I'm not from down there. I'm right here and y'all not treating me right. You know. So don't put it off on somebody else. You've got to deal with this here. You know, she's extremely important. So we know about her. But we don't know enough about Amanda Berry Smith. Well, what did she do? She's born in slavery. Her father and mother bought her out of slavery. Right? She's born in Maryland. They moved her up into New York, you know, free part of New York. Uh, and when they died, she began to try to buy her relatives out of slavery. And so she worked as a washerwoman, you know, lost all of her kids in childbirth, tuberculosis, okay, because she spent all of her hours, 20 hours a day, bent over a tub, cold water, hot water, washing people's clothes, wringing out those clothes, ironing those clothes. Yeah. and lug it in a big barrel to somebody's home, right? But clearly there was more in store for her than doing that. Yeah. And she was in the AME church, but the AME church wouldn't let her do what she wanted to do. You know, She thought she had been called to speak you know, God's word without going through the AME church. Well, the AME church bishops weren't exactly happy about that. Uh, Matter of fact, they wouldn't let her do it. So she went and became an evangelist by herself. Right? Toured with the Fifth Jubilee Singers, spent eight years in Africa as a missionary. Right? Was renowned all over the Christian world, you know, for her singing and her prayer. You know. Was one of the first people to experience sanctification, you know. Then she wrote her autobiography. And that's where Mason reads her autobiography in eighteen ninety nine. He reads it shortly thereafter. And that's what gets Mason to go to the Azusa Revival, to meet Seymour. Right? Which is where Church of God in Christ comes from, Pentecostal Church comes from. Right? So without Amanda Berry Smith doing God's word in her way, without permission, without in the structure of a church that says men are up here and women are down there, she went out and God spoke to her and she spoke back, you know, and she started a whole movement that ends up with what you have here today. You know, you are connected to her. You know, she's not somebody in a book. She's not somebody out there somewhere. Right? Without her, you are not here. Right? This is the role of black women in American history. Under everything that we do, if we stand back and look deeply enough, we will find black women moving and shaking and putting things into being. Uh, second person I want to talk, and I'll talk a bit more about this because uh, this is a person I really owe is uh, probably the most powerful black figure in the uh, 20th century between probably the death of Booker T. Washington and the rise of Martin Luther King. And that's Mary McLeod Bethune. Right. Uh, I'll begin with a, with a personal account. Without Miss Bethune, I wouldn't be here. I mean, literally, I would not be here. Right. My mother had a degree from the University of Chicago, master's degree in education. 1930. During the Depression, she didn't have a job, so she, got, she was a jeans teacher. She got a scholarship, and she went around the South. Her job was to go around and look at rural black schools in the South. She was in Florida, Lucia County. She stops by Bethune Cookman. Right? Miss Bethune says, ah, oh, this is a nice young woman. Why don't you work for me? That was Miss Bethune's recruiting process. You know, uh, I found the records in the records of Bethune Cookman, and it's a one sentence. You know, this is Miss Helen Harris. She's a fine young woman. Put her on the faculty. And she took this little note over to the dean of faculties. I guess he thought he was in charge. Uh, and that's how she got a job at Bethune-Cookman College. Why is that important? Because also at Bethune-Cookman College was my father. Right? My brother graduated from college when she was 19 years old. So by the time she got to teaching, she was about the same age as the undergraduates at Bethune-Cookman. So she and my father were about the same age, even though she was on the faculty and he was a student. 
And of course, without them, I wouldn't be here. Right? So like, I owe Miss Bethune big time. <laughs> right? Big time. There's, no, there's nothing I can say about Miss Bethune that can top that. Right? Because literally without her, seeing something in my mother and putting her on the payroll, they're giving her a job in the middle of the Depression, 1935, 1936, when there are no jobs, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't be here. Uh, she was close friends of my uh, grandmother and grandfather in Sanford, Florida. My grandfather worked on the Atlantic Coastline Railroad as a mechanic. He could take apart a locomotive engine uh, with, his, with his hands. When I was a little kid in the Second World War, I used to ride around with him on his lap, and we'd sit up in the trains, and he could drive the trains. Now, of course, black people are supposed to know how to drive these trains, but I know that's not so because I sat in my granddaddy's lap when he drove the train because I got to pull the whistle and make all that noise. It's like I know black people can drive a locomotive. Like I went in one. Right? You know, I know what happened when they pulled out of the station in Sanford and the white engineer went to sleep and say, Sip, you handle it. And he took it all the way into Jackson and then the white engineer wakes up and waves to the crowd coming into the station. No, no, black people can do a lot of stuff they say they couldn't do. But in addition to being an engineer, he also sent everybody in our family to college. And but Miss Bethune, when she came to Sanford, stayed in our house, my grandmother's house. You know. And when I was growing up down there, uh, my grandmother would talk about these people because they were like part of the world in which you were part of. You know. uh, and she would tell you about Miss Bethune and Mary Church Terrell. She said, like, she liked Mary Church Terrell, but Mary Church Terrell would come to the house, you know, meeting, you know, the NAACP. National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Uh, and Ms. Terrell would sit in the living room and wait for something to happen. Right? Ms. Bethune would show up and say, Katie Gracie, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm, you know, I'm fixing dinner. Well, she'd take off her coat and lay it down, take off her hat. Bethune made her own hats. You know, if you ever seen them, Bethune made her own hats. Some people didn't like them, but she made her own hats. Right? She'd roll up her sleeves, put on an apron, and fry chicken. Baked biscuits, clean chickens. Y'all don't know about that now, you buy them in a package, right? But in the old days, you had to go out, you know, which I hated to see, and you chop your head off, you put it in that hot water, and that cold water to get the feathers off, right? Because you don't want fried chicken with, <laughs> with feathers on it, it doesn't taste good. Uh, the feathers don't jump off the chicken by itself. Somebody got to take the feathers off, and that sister of putting it in the hot water and the cold water and pulling the feathers off. And Miss Platoon would be sitting there. Right. <coughs> President of the National Association of Color Women's Clubs. Right. Advisor to Eleanor Roosevelt. Frying chicken. Baking biscuits. Talking politics the whole time. So by the time she got back into the living room and Mary Church Taylor to sit there, want to know when is the meeting going to start, the meeting is over. <laughs> <laughs> meeting is over. Right. That's how Bethune amassed the power that she got among black people. Right? She's born in South Carolina. Like my grandparents were born in South Carolina. You know, they later moved to Florida. One of 15 children. She chopped cotton. Right? She didn't go to Howard University or Fisk or Morehouse. She went to Moody Bible Institute. Right? It's the only place she could afford to go. She wanted to be a missionary, go to Africa. They wouldn't send her to Africa. No okay, I'll be a missionary here. Right? She started a school for girls in Daytona Beach, which consisted of a storefront and Miss Bethune. And she'd walk up and down the beaches and have the young women sing and collect money to build her school. She's a very smart woman, one of the most brilliant people that ever lived. Down the street from her storefront, was Cookman Institute, run by poor Mr. Albert Cookman. Ms. Bethune talked to Mr. Cookman, and all of a sudden you have Bethune Cookman Institute, and we haven't heard from Mr. Cookman since. <laughs> right? We to this day don't know what happened to Mr. Cookman. He vanished from history. You know, her name was first, she was the president, and Mr. Cookman is still trying to figure out, I thought I had a school, she didn't have a school, now she got a school and I don't have no job. <laughs> Right? That's Miss Bethune. Right? And he probably felt good about being slid out of there. Because he didn't know what happened. That's how smart she was. Right? She was active in the club movement. 